There is no intro joke. There is only chaos. 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 We're here to kill chaos. So, Square Enix's E3 2021 conference, am I right? Okay, so this conference wasn't absolutely awful, but with the Marvel stuff basically taking up way too much screen time, stuff that looks kinda cool only getting a small mention, and the trailer for Babylon's Fall having the impact of a puff of air being blown in your face, side note, that trailer was a serious downgrade compared to the one we got in 2019. The conference honestly wasn't that good either. However, there was one trailer that was notable for one reason or another. A trailer for an upcoming project called Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, an action RPG taking place in the world of the original Final Fantasy with a dark fantasy edge and tone. What they did show off in terms of gameplay honestly did look pretty cool, at least in my opinion, but the trailer was notable because of... Chaos. Those. Yeah, those quickly delved their way into meme territory, and after all that, this just became a game that people mostly said, that looks fine, good for that, and just moved on. I myself wasn't stoked for this, but as someone who wants to get more and more into this franchise, I did have some mild interest, especially since Square brought Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja for this one. Now, this game, as of this point, has had three demos so far, and the one I have here right now is supposed to be a representative of what the game will be like when it hits door shelves. So, I have some interest, they gave a demo that coincided with the showcase at the recent state of play, so... What do we have here? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so first thing I raised an eyebrow at, you need to be connected to the internet the entire time you're playing this demo. For multiplayer, I get that, but I do not understand why this is the case for the lone player. What's the point, and what does Square Enix have to gain from that? I mean, the game is performed perfectly fine on my end despite this, so I'm not sure if shaky internet connections can affect the experience, but it's still a very odd choice. I'm glad to say that the game is definitely going to perform well, at least on PS5. 60 frames per second with almost no stutters in sight, short load times, and everything works as intended. There were no moments during my playtime where input lag or presentation lag interfered with how I played the game. From what I've noticed, Team Ninja usually prioritizes performance, even if it means compromising a few aspects about the quality to achieve it. Even if you can tell where those compromises are, like the in-game dialogue sequences looking kinda eh, and a few instances of lackluster textures or bad lighting, at the end of the day, the game looks really good. I really do like how it approaches the overall style of a dark fantasy world, since the dark colors aren't used to mute the whole picture out, and there are plenty of areas that can look pretty beautiful. The areas as a whole do get the job done in terms of being decently fun to explore, and they do their best to make backtracking no hassle at all in case you miss something or you want to heal your party, which is convenient because every time you heal or save at one of these points, every minor enemy you took down respawns. I can work with this because of the aforementioned level design making backtracking convenient, and because they're usually placed within reasonable distance of one another, not to mention they refill your potions in case you're below five of them, but you're going to want to keep that in mind. But all this means is that there's more time to spend in combat sequences, and honestly, I think these are the biggest things that the game wants to focus on, because I had a lot of fun with them. I'll admit, having normal attacks being mapped to the R1 button, special attacks being mapped to the R2 button, and dodging being mapped to the X button took a bit of time to get used to, but I really got into the fighting once I wrapped my head around that. The amount of space you have to pull off a dodge after an attack isn't always big, so you need to keep a cool head when taking into account when an enemy is making their move, or if they're staggered, especially when it comes to how you use your MP. Each special attack requires some from this gauge, so it's best to only use special attacks sparingly, but you'll be able to get some back through normal moves, which really does help. However, the depth of this system comes in with three major mechanics. While you can guard normally with the L1 button, you can alternatively use the circle button to do a soul guard, which is basically like parrying. Using it against melee attacks does net you a window of opportunity to strike a foe, but when using it against projectiles, you can essentially steal it, store it, and then use it against another enemy. I didn't find a whole lot of uses for it, as the window of this move going off is extremely tight, but I do enjoy it when it is easier to pull off. Besides, doing it against an enemy arrow will essentially be like this. This also does help against the second mechanic, which is the enemy stun meter. You can deplete the enemy's HP to zero, and it'll get you results, but I prioritize stunning the enemy more, because once you do, you can kill them on the spot and have a lot more MP rewarded to you. And given the importance of MP, it's best to understand how exactly you can use this to your benefit, especially when it comes to finding particular weapons or elements specific foes are weak to. The third mechanic is what really opens up the number of approaches you have towards encounters, and really, what makes this game replayable. 
the class system. You can have two classes on you at all times, and almost all of them have a different assortment of weapons and skills to work with. From the start, you only have access to three. Swordsman, which doesn't attack very quickly, but is good in terms of damage output and range. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of Cloud's playstyle in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Pugilist, which basically lets you punch things. And Duelist, where you have two smaller swords, which is a good alternative in case the swordsman's speed isn't your cup of tea. But as you go on, you'll unlock more. The amount you can get is great for catering to multiple playstyles, and every challenge is doable regardless of which two you decided to take, so it's a matter of preference. Personally, I enjoy the Ronin class the most because I'm a fan of samurai aesthetics, and I found them to be excellent in terms of attack speed and range, and they can get stun meters down reliably. But some other ones I grew fond of are the Sword Wielder, which is the perfect middle ground, the Mage, because of the elemental weaknesses and the convenience in almost every encounter, the aforementioned Pugilist, the Lancer, which has great range and really fun special attacks, and finally the Marauder, because sometimes I just want to slam a giant axe into everything. Heck, one of the upgrades even gives you super armor during special attacks, the Byleth jokes write themselves. I'd highly recommend giving each class some attention to find which ones you really like the most, and to give them all experience. The game doesn't have experience growth for the characters specifically, more so their classes. On surface level, it's very traditional, as leveling up grants higher stats and skill points that you can take to the class's skill tree. But that skill tree can grant you extra moves, which can be mapped to a specific attack sequence, moves that you can map to your L2 menu, which you can use at any time, most of which give you passive perk, like increased stun output or adding poison properties to your weapons. And finally, advanced versions of these classes, which come with more moves. You definitely have a lot to work with in terms of what you want, and I'd also recommend considering which class might be handier for what encounter, which the game will help you with since classes you're not using will gain experience, albeit at a slower rate. And if you die, you're set back to your last save point, which usually isn't that far away, and you retain any experience you gained before dying. Though there are two snags I have with this. Sometimes I feel like you lose health way too fast. I mean, I get that you constantly get equipment that might have a weakness or two, meaning you only need to think about what's up ahead, and I get that messing up can lead to punishment, but even so, I feel it messing with the pace a little bit, meaning that there were some potion breaks in uncomfortable places. So I think they could have scaled that back a little bit. I'm playing on action difficulty by the way, which is the normal difficulty, and even then, this leads to the occasional encounter feeling scattered and messy, which is made more apparent because the camera could use some tweaking. It acts weird against walls, and likes to snap when it gets back into the open. When you're up against a horde of enemies targeting you, it doesn't show you everything around you, leading to some cheap shots, and sometimes it gets confused to the point where it's hard to tell what's what. Though in terms of gameplay, I'd say the low point is the boss battles, as they can have attacks that can take away half your health, and worst of all, unless you get their stun mirror down or their health to a certain point, it's impossible to stagger them, even if you manage to use the soul guard against them. This severely limits approach options in a game where approach options are usually fun to find, which leads to them being not very fun to fight overall. I would have preferred it if they rewarded you more for attacking when they're at their most vulnerable, or having a way to stagger them using things like the Soul Guard. But despite all that, the gameplay is remarkably solid, and I wasn't expecting to have as much fun as I did. It's able to be a good compromise between satisfying feedback and fleshed out mechanics, and I think this is what the game is most focused on because... I'm sorry, this plot is not grabbing me. I mean, at base value it's pretty straightforward, with an unlikely group of warriors volunteering to search for crystals across the land and killing chaos, but only does it feel like quite a few details are being skimmed over, leading to fragmented narrating. But this writing isn't very good. It's just exposition about what the world was, and what everyone is going to do, with so little actual character. Aside from Jed and maybe a snippet of Princess Sarah, I feel like there isn't anything that establishes character. Jack wants to kill chaos, and that's it. Ash. I don't know anything about him. Neon I like the idea of, but she clearly becomes a name in a party list after her introduction, and I don't remember much about anyone else. The most I can say about how the story is shaping up to be is that there are moments that are unintentionally funny, like Jack, Ash, and Jed meet up just because their crystals resonate with one another, okay, and after Neon is freed and exposition is given, Jack just walks out and uses his crystal to play tunes in his ears? I'm sorry, do crystals work like iPhones or something? Does this world have Raycons? Come on, I don't think you can just slip that in and expect everyone to follow. I mean, at the end of the day, I can look past it as the cutscenes don't take very long, and most of the time went into gameplay, but still, if you're looking for a good narrative, I don't think you'll find it here. But if you're looking for a really fun action RPG with a lot of interesting mechanics, you will find that here. I was surprised by how much fun I had here, learning the ins and outs of each class, and taking foes I could take on. And I was surprised that after I was done with the main missions, there were several things I had yet to learn. 
I do think the HP threshold, the camera, and the bosses are decent tweaking, but I could see this pleasing many people and selling a healthy amount of copies. I don't know if I'll get this immediately, as I'm not sure this will be worth $60 in my eyes, but if you really like what you see here, give this demo a shot, and if you want to spend that money to get it, go on ahead. I can safely say that from the looks of things, this game will at least be worth your time. If you do want to go down the route of trying out this demo, I should warn you that it's getting delisted sometime next month. So download it and try it out as soon as you can, and think about whether you want to purchase it later. Don't know why it's only there for a limited time, but hey, what can you do? I'm the Lightning Ripper, and the fact that the main character's name is actually Jack cracks me up way more than it really should. I'll see you all next time!